On October 31, 2016, the Swedish city of Malmö hosted a joint commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the Protestant Reformation. Even Pope Francis traveled to Sweden to attend the ceremonies. Catholics and Protestants are looking back together on the five centuries since Martin Luther posted his famous 95 Theses. The event was organized by the Lutheran World Federation, which was founded in 1947 in the Swedish city of Lund. As we continue our journey from conflict to communion, the gospel of the Lord, I am the true wine and my father is the wine grower. Among the hosts was the Archbishop of the Church of Sweden, Antje Jakalein, the head of one of the world's largest Lutheran communities. He prunes to make it bear more fruit. This wasn't the first time the Pope and the Archbishop had met. In May 2015, Antje Jakarlein visited the Pontiff in Rome. She was the first female Archbishop ever to be received in the Vatican. The castle and the two spires of the cathedral are the picturesque landmarks of the small city of Uppsala near Stockholm. This is where Archbishop Jakarlein has her seat. At just under 120 meters, the Uppsala Cathedral is the tallest religious building in Scandinavia. The city was once a major center of power in Sweden. Twelve kings were crowned here. Uppsala has retained its importance as a center of religion. Since 2014, the Church of Sweden has been headed by a woman. It's the first time that's been the case in the church's centuries-long history. What has always been important to me is that church services are the center of Christian life and should project the joy of being Christian. I talk a lot about the joy of services. The Church of Sweden has its headquarters near the cathedral. This is Antje Jakarlein's office. Jakarlein has a doctorate in theology. She's convinced that religious work should be closely connected with politics, culture, and science. From my own personal perspective, I want to believe with my rational mind and not in spite of it. From a larger perspective, I would say that the knowledge of faith, theology, the experience of faith, and our faith and trust in knowledge, including the natural sciences and science in general, is jointly responsible for the goodness in the world. At 61, Jakelein is the 70th Archbishop of Uppsala. That makes her the highest representative of a Lutheran community that encompasses six million Swedes. Sweden's Lutheran community is one of the largest in the world. At least 60% of the population are members of the church. Jakelein is German. She was born in 1955 in the small town of Hedeke in the west of the country. 
She first came to Uppsala to pursue her studies, and she never returned to Germany. She has little family there. Her parents are deceased, and her daughters live in Sweden with families of their own. After her studies, Jacqueline spent some time teaching in the U.S., but then decided to return to Sweden to work as a clergywoman. The concept of home has changed for me over time. It's less about a geographical place than the experience of time. Wherever I feel a sense of belonging, I feel at home. Da ist für mich dann auch immer ein Stück Heimat. Women have been allowed to serve as clergy in Sweden since 1959. Of Sweden's 13 dioceses, two are headed by female bishops. Jacqueline herself was Bishop of Lund for seven years. Despite the large number of church members, Sweden is a secular country where interest in religion is declining. Even the name Martin Luther has lost its context for many Swedes. It depends on whom you ask. There are some who hear Luther and say, Martin Luther King? There are people who have no relationship to Luther. But Swedish culture contains the common notion of Luther sitting on your shoulder. It's meant as a reminder to keep things from getting too flippant and remind us of our duties. Actually, these concepts have more to do with Kant, orthodoxy and pietism, than with the real Luther, if you can use such a phrase. That surprised me about Sweden. I think Sweden is unique in maintaining this boring, sad, dark image of Luther instead of the lively, colorful, and complex figure that's truer to history. Five hundred years ago, the Lutheran Reformation forever changed how many people approached faith and religion. The center of this revolution was the eastern German town of Wittenberg. Luther preached his sermons at the town and parish church of St. Mary's. The point is not to idealize Luther, but to understand his objectives and put them into contemporary terms in the context of personal liberation through scripture. It's about what connects us today and what it means to preach and live liberation. Liberation was a controversial idea back in Luther's day just as it still is sometimes today. One of the constraints we experience in our world is consumerism. Increasingly in our relationships, we're treated as customers and not autonomous fellow citizens. That's also sometimes the case in church. So one of our aims is to investigate what it means to be a member of society. June 2016. Jacqueline has come to Wittenberg as a delegate for a meeting of the Council of the Lutheran World Federation. So today, let us invite each other to remember our baptism at the Mother Church of the Reformation, the place where Martin Luther regularly preached, in the place where the spiritual journey of the Reformation began. We are invited to remember the beginning of our own spiritual journey.
The conference was held in Wittenberg's Stadthaus. Delegates discussed not only the preparations for the 500th anniversary of the Reformation in 2017, but also fundamental issues like the significance of religion and church in the present-day globalized world. The Lutheran World Federation has its headquarters in Geneva, Switzerland. It brings together 145 churches from 98 countries. 72 million people worldwide are members. The fact that together we help take care of two million refugees is something that makes an impression and is a true expression of our faith and our identity. Uppsala, in late August. This time, guests from all over the world have come here. A new bishop is being ordained. It's a special day for everyone, including Archbishop Jacqueline. It's a rare occasion for her to don her festive garments. The entire event reminds Jacqueline of June 15, 2014, when she received the Archbishop's insignia and became the head of the Church of Sweden. It was a wonderful day. What I remember most was the great sense of joy that came over so many people. In part, that was because I was the first female archbishop. There was so much joy. When the official part of the ceremony was over, there were celebrations and applause in the cathedral. It was overwhelming. The warmth, support and positive expectations gave me a strength I still feel. Will du i Guds den treniges namn åtaga dig uppdraget att vara biskop och utöva detta så att Gud blir ärad, kyrkan uppbyggd och Guds vilja förverkligat i världen. Today Sören Dalevi is being ordained bishop of Karlstad. At age 47, he's unusually young for the office. Okay. You're looking at me. Okay. It's Dalavi's big day. The mood is excellent. It's always great when representatives of the worldwide church are here. It makes us feel that as Church of Sweden, we are part of a global church. Symbolic gestures of togetherness are important. The church is losing more and more members. There's a lot of work to be done. I would say that we are in a very interesting point because we, we are, I think we are, we are more important than, than we think ourselves. I think when it comes to values, when it comes to what happens in society today, I think the Swedish church has a lot to offer and to give. And, and, and I think we are one of the fundaments in, 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 in the Swedish society. There's a reception at the Archbishop's residence. This is where Jacqueline lives and receives people in her office as the head of the church. As usual, Jacqueline and her husband Heinz greet their guests together. He too is German and actually came to Sweden first. 
People often say to me, your wife is the archbishop and you're just a pastor. How can you stand that? But I don't have a problem with it. I always joke, as a man, I can only live if I'm married to a beautiful and clever woman. Her future husband was the main reason Antje Jakelein stayed on after her first semester at Uppsala University in 1977. I think, I think things would have been very different if I were alone. It's important to have the feeling that there's someone there who shares my joy, who puts up with me if I'm tired or in a bad mood, and who accepts it if I'm bothered by something or get stressed out. But someone who can also say, hey, you're not listening to me. The Jacqueline's met not far from the Archbishop's residence where they now live. That's where it started, in that house. On our anniversaries, we can go out on this little balcony here with a glass of champagne, look over there and then look each other in the eye and drink a toast. Back in our day, that house was part of the theology department. The Jacqueline's moved around a lot. They were constantly on the go and had to get used to new surroundings. First, Heinz Jacqueline gave up his job as a pastor in Sweden so that they could go to Chicago, where his wife worked and taught as a theologist. One of her main interests was temporality. Antje Jacqueline's doctoral thesis was titled Time and Eternity, The Question of Time in Church, Science and Theology. In 1999, she received her doctorate from Lund University. If time is all there is, and it's lost its connection to eternity, the result is stress, the pressure to experience things, and a culture of acceleration in which we think that things are automatically better if they're faster. That can have direct negative consequences. If you've gotten accustomed to acceleration, you experience every obstacle as something bad. And that can lead, for instance, to xenophobia, since encounters with something foreign mean that you have to slow down. It's an obstacle to acceleration. It requires time. The Church of Sweden, like churches in many places, has to deal with a growing disinterest in religion. Most Swedes consider religion a private matter. That makes it difficult for the church to start a public dialogue about religious topics. Until 2000, the Church of Sweden was a state church. And until around 1994, Swedish schools taught the basics of the Christian faith. When that stopped, the church didn't step up and say, now we have to take responsibility. We just let the situation slide a bit. And now we have the situation that schools provide some orientation about religion in general, but not from the standpoint that all of us have some sort of relationship to a tradition of faith. And we have very few households in which children are socialized as Christians. Part of the tradition of the Church of Sweden is its relationship to the Swedish royal family. Whether it's King Carl Gustav XVI or someone else, 
A member of the royal family attends almost all major church events. The Archbishop is also usually on hand for major occasions of the royal family, like at the baptism of Prince Alexander in September 2016. There's a certain amount of public interest and excitement, but the main thing is that it's a religious service which expresses joy and gratitude. And the prince will receive a gift that is the best one can get, even as a prince. Trottningholm Palace in Stockholm. The baptism takes place in a small chapel. Traditionally, the Swedish royal family belongs to the Church of Sweden. So the duties of the archbishops include conducting royal weddings and baptizing new members of the royal family. I think it was nice for him. He was very attentive. And when he heard the words, Jesus Christ, the crucified and resurrected, calls you to become his disciple, he wiggled around and his eyes opened wide. The Gothenburg Book Fair. The four-day event takes place every year in late September and attracts 100,000 visitors. It's the biggest cultural event in Scandinavia. The book fair is also an important event for Antje Jekyllin. She's in constant demand as a discussion partner. Here there is great interest in her as a person and in what the church has to say. She gladly takes the chance to communicate with people directly. And this year she's published a new book, a collection of essays and sermons. The autograph session is packed. For many years, the Church of Sweden has had the book fair's largest space for readings and panels. Every 30 minutes, there's a new discussion. The Archbishop is both a host and a guest. The space is always full. It's a common belief that Sweden is a very secular country, which is true in some respects. But there's another side to it, and you see it on occasions like this. This year, media interest was particularly intense. A few months ago, Jacqueline was attacked on Twitter, accused of letting others write parts of her books. What happened on Twitter in the case of the Archbishop Jacqueline is just a small sign of what has happened globally in media and in the public sphere, where there's a disregard today for facts. I mean, there's a person who can say basically whatever he or she wants on a big scale. You can see this in the case of Donald Trump, for instance. He can say whatever lies he wants. You could see it in the Brexit referendum in Great Britain as well. And no matter on how you, you, you uh, contest to these lies, they are dis the, the facts are disregarded. So the lies keep on living. In Sweden, we lack discussions and conversations on a high intellectual level. And in those circumstances, it's easy for distortions, caricatures and half-truths to pass themselves off as the truth. September 2016. The General Synod in Uppsala's new conference center. Representatives from Sweden's 13 dioceses are advising on the future challenges faced by the church. The discussions go on behind closed doors. One of the most important topics is how the church and Swedish society should deal with other cultures and religions. Archbishop Antje Jakelin is popular among both Lutheran clergy and the general populace in Sweden. But she also faces considerable resistance on topics like environmentalism, education and xenophobia. 
Nevertheless, her focus, with an eye towards the anniversary of the Reformation, remains on the ecumenical dialogue between Protestants and Catholics. The joint ceremony on October 31, 2016, was a powerful sign that the anniversary is important to all Christians. There's no overlooking the fact that this is the first time on a global level the Reformation has been jointly commemorated. I think the long-term influence of the event will only become apparent in retrospect.